So good morning, all, and welcome, welcome back. Uh, I'm very glad you did come back for this. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about knowledge as a fact of mental state. Um, that idea that knowledge is a fact of mental state is, uh, is not mine. It's uh, an ancient idea in the history of philosophy, maybe going back as far as Plato. Um, but in our century, um, celebrated, made famous, and adamantly defended by last year's Frege lecturer, uh, Timothy Williamson. What I want to do today is talk a little bit about uh, Williamson's theory of knowledge as a fact of mental state, and then try to connect it to what's going on in ordinary mental state attribution in the course of human development. We're going to see that there's a little bit of a puzzle about knowledge as a fact of mental state. Even if you can explain why we start out attributing this kind of very powerful state, this connection between an agent and reality, uh, there's a real mystery about why we continue to attribute it after we've developed the capacity to attribute the more guarded, more cautious state of believing, which is a slightly more subtle state. It's a state that only uh, human beings, as far as we know, can attribute. Other animals aren't capable of attributing that more subtle state. Um, we're going to speak very briefly of the advantages of being able to attribute this more subtle state. Uh, and then we'll look at the question of why, uh, why we still hold on to the older, more primitive notion of knowledge alongside belief. Because if we look at patterns of human speech, we attribute knowledge freely and frequently, and in fact, uh, at least in English, uh, more often than, uh, than we attribute states of belief. So the verb's in actually heavier use um, than the verb to think. Um, and it, I think that there are quite a number of languages where that's, where that's the case. I'm going to try to explain a little bit about why that is. And we'll end today with the problem of common knowledge, uh, which is a problem that has recently argued, been argued to be uh, uh, un unsolvable. Uh, it's been argued recently that we can't, in principle, have common knowledge of a proposition. Um, I find this argument very, very interesting and very, very hard to get over. Uh, I'll explain briefly what common knowledge is, and then I'll explain to you what Harvey Letterman's argument is against it. Uh, and with any luck this afternoon, we'll look at a new framework which might give us an alternative to the kind of problem that uh, Letterman identifies for us. So that's an overview of what we're doing today. Um, let's dive in. Um, if you have a look at your handout, one of the obvious questions you might have when you hear that knowledge is a fact of mental state is the question of what exactly is meant by fact of. Uh, and here there's a tremendous embarrassment, um, which is that this piece of common technical vocabulary is just used differently in philosophy and in linguistics. And there's a kind of bizarre reason why the difference doesn't trip us up more than it does, right? That, um, that there's a strange, uh, a strange little gap. We'll see that in principle, something could be factive in one sense, but not the other. And yet, in practice, you might expect that there could be a lot of, for example, mental states which are factive in one sense, but not the other. In practice, there aren't any states that fall into that gray zone. Um, so we're going, to, we're going to try to figure out why that is. OK, so we'll start with what is common to philosophy and to linguistics as far as use of fact of, uh, is concerned. So there's actually quite a bit of overlap in what they mean. There's just a strange little area of discrepancy. So linguists and philosophers both agree that the verb to know is factive and the verb to believe or to think uh, is non-factive. Um, so the idea of factivity has something to do with attaching you only to the truth. Um, if you know that P, P has to be true. Uh, if you just think that P is the case, P might be true, P might be false. Uh, it's non-factive. It can take either kind of complement. Um, so if you look at your handout, um, both philosophers and linguists will agree that uh, the first of the following two sentences leaves the truth of its embedded complement, uh, the keys are in the box, an open question, and the second doesn't. So you have sentence number one, Alice thinks that the keys are in the box. Maybe they're there, maybe they're not. Two, Brad knows that the keys are in the box. If Brad knows that the keys are in the box, 
where are the keys? They're in the box. Um, that's, a, that's a fact of expression. It selects for true complements. Both sides also <coughs> agree uh, about standard examples of factive and non-factive expressions. So both sides agree that knows that, is aware that, recognizes that, notices that, sees that. All of those expressions are factive. Um, they must have true complements. Both sides also agree that expressions like thinks that, believes that, suspects that, is highly confident that, is absolutely sure that. All of those expressions are non-factive. So you can be absolutely sure um, that your car is in the driveway right now, but unfortunately it has been stolen, right? You can bet the farm uh, that you're, you have a winning hand at poker right now and, and you can lose the farm. Uh, that way. Um, so so um, the expression of high subjective confidence uh, is not taken either by philosophers or by linguists um, to be the same as the idea of having a lock on the truth. Um, if you see that the pencil is on the table, however, um, that expression uh, is taken to be something that attaches you just to the truth. Philosophers have, if you like, a simpler understanding of what factive is. Uh, and Timothy Williamson's formulation of it, which is on your handout, is the standard formulation in philosophy. So a propositional attitude is factive if and only if necessarily one has it only to truths. Uh, so that's what, that's what philosophers mean by factive, that there's this property of entailment uh, of the truth between the possession of the attitude and the embedded proposition. Not all factive propositional attitudes denote mental states. Um, so processes like forgetting and learning um, are factive. Um, you can only forget that the pencil is on the table uh, if, in fact, it's true that the pencil's on the table. Um, but uh, among factive mental states, if you have a factive construction that is connecting an agent um, to a state of affairs, uh, like the state of affairs of the pencil being on the table, uh, and, sorry, and you, you, sorry, you, if you have a if you have a mental state of um, either seeing that it's the case or knowing that it's the case, any of those, um, knowledge seems to have a, a special status. So Williamson has argued that knowledge is the basic or default mental state. It's the mother of all the mental states, right? It's what all the other factive mental states have in common. Um, if you, you can be aware that something is the case without seeing that it's the case. So for example, if there is a tapping sound coming from behind you, you can be aware that there's a tapping sound in the room even if you don't see that there's a tapping sound in the room. Um, but if you're either aware of something, or sorry, aware that something is the case, or you see that it's the case, uh, it's going to follow from that that you know that it's the case. Um, so knowing is the basic, the most generic fact of mental status, the one that's entailed um, by all the others. It's the one that all the others have in common. OK. Linguists, meanwhile, uh, use the word factive uh, a little bit more restrictively. They pack a bit more into it. So linguists reserve the term veridical for predicates like, uh, for predicates that just entail their complement cause. Uh, so for predicates that have um, the structure of uh, being such that necessarily you have them only to truths. Um, so an expression like is right that uh, it, that's something you can have only towards truths. Um, if you are right that your car is in the driveway, then it must be the case that your car is in the driveway. How linguists use the term factive uh, is for predicates that not only entail but also presuppose the truth of their complements. What's presupposed is just taken as a background truth, uh, even when the fact of construction gets embedded under ordinary sentential negation or gets cast into a question, um, placed in the antecedent of a conditional or under, uh, under a possibility modal. So you'll notice if I say that Jane knows that she's being followed, it follows from that, if I'm a sincere speaker, that Jane is being followed. But equally, if I'll say Jane doesn't know that she's being followed, um, 
you're going to infer that Jane is being followed. Or if I ask you, does Jane know that she's being followed? Um, you'll ordinarily take away from that um, the, uh, the sense that it actually is the case, um, that Jane is being followed. Now, that natural presupposition, does he know that he's um, in trouble? That natural presupposition can be canceled. Uh, you can, um, for example, say, Jane doesn't know that she's being followed um, because she isn't being followed. She's just paranoid, right? You'll notice that when I negated it that way, I put a little extra emphasis on the word no, as if to suggest, you know, no is kind of the wrong word here. She doesn't know that. Um, and it's usually appropriate for me to, uh, to do that, only maybe in a conversational context where other people have been speaking as if they're assuming that Jane knows that she's being followed. So I step in with that correction. This is slightly the wrong word um, to be using. But, um, and, and similarly with questions also. Um, does Jane know that she's being followed or does she just think she, that she's being followed? Um, same kind of thing. I can set up an explicit contrast, emphasize the verb as if I'm raising questions about its propriety. But ordinarily, when you just ask, um, does he know the meaning is canceled? Uh, you'll do that in a context where uh, uh, it's known that the, that the meeting is canceled. It's known by the speaker, of course, not, um, uh, not, by, the, not by the target. Um, so I want to say our instinctive attributions of ignorance and our instinctive questions about what people know um, are carried out against a background of reality, right? So when I talk about, oh, what he didn't know was that P, um, I'm usually going to be selecting P from the domain of things that I'm assuming to be true. Uh, if I instinctively see you as ignorant of something, um, usually the something that I see you as ignorant of uh, is something from within the world of truth, from within the world of reality. Uh, okay, so we've got the idea of the philosophical understanding of factivity where it's just entailment uh, of the complement straight entailment, and we've got the idea of the linguist's conception of factivity, where it's entailment of the complement and presupposition of the complement also under various embedded constructions. And you'll notice that there are some constructions where these meanings come apart. So constructions like is right and is correct, um, they actually might look at first like they constitute some kind of challenge to Williamson's framework, um, because they don't entail knowing despite the fact that they concern states rather than processes. So being right that something's the case is not like learning or forgetting. It's not like acquiring knowledge or losing knowledge. Being right that something's the case is a steady state. It's a state that could go on. You can be right all day long, right? Um, and being right is also a state which is necessarily held only to truth. I can't be right about something um, that's actually false. But here's the problem. You don't have to know that the Russians interfered in the last American election to be right that the Russians interfered in the last American inter election, right? Um, you can be right about something even if the fact that you're right about it is kind of a lucky coincidence, you know? Maybe you have your unfounded suspicions about who is the murderer. Uh, maybe you have a lucky guess about who is the murderer. You're not a detective. You don't even have good evidence on the question. But you could be right that um, you know, Jones or Smith committed the murder, right? So that could look like a problem for Williamson's thesis that knowing is the most general fact of mental state, right? You've got, it seems, this state of being right that something's the case. Uh, and that doesn't entail knowing that it's the case. Um, however, fortunately for Williamson, um, predicates like is right that, is correct that, um, are, and here I'm drawing on work by Valentin Hakard and Pranav Anand, predicates like this are not mental state predicates, actually. They might presuppose that an agent has a certain mental state on the point in question, but they're not specifying the mental state. They leave it wide open what the mental state is. The mental state could be a state of suspicion. It could be a state of very firm conviction. It could be anything in between. 
One of the signs that predicates like this aren't mental state predicates is that they don't even select for sentient subjects. So usually a predicate um, gets to count as a mental state predicate if um, it's the sort of thing that can only be applied to a subject that is sentient, that is an agent that could have mental states. Like, so take the predicate is happy, right? That's a mental state predicate. Um, I mean, it's possible to say something like, the chair is happy, uh, right? But only if you're getting like very sort of cutesy or metaphorical or, um, or uh, anthropomorphizing the chair in some way, right? So we don't usually think of this. It, it, it looks like is happy has to be restricted to sentient subjects. Um, predicates like is right that um, can, are, are not restricted to sentient subjects. So you can say, the report is right that uh, the Russians interfered in the election. Or you can say the book is right that Smith was the murderer, something like that. Um, and you can't do that with mental state predicates. So you can't say the report knows that uh, the Russians interfered, or the report or the book um, believes that uh, that Smith was the murderer. Right? Those those predicates, according to um, Anand and Hakkard, and I think they're quite convincing on this point, those predicates, um, uh, it, th those predicates like know and believe, um, really do select for sentient subjects where is right, that is correct, that don't. Um, Anand and Hakkard have the proposal that what's going on with is right, that, and is correct, that, is that those um, predicates are marking not a mental state on the part of an agent, um, but they're marking some kind of communicative contribution um, to a discourse, which is something that can be executed by a repository of information, like a report or a book, uh, as well as by an agent. So it's a different kind of thing um, that's getting captured with those, uh, with those predicates. Um, OK, so we've got the idea that is right that is factive in Williamson's sense, um, but it's not a mental state predicate. Uh, and because he's saying knowledge is the most general fact of mental state, um, is right that doesn't turn out to be a counterexample to his theory. Um, now here's the, here's the really kind of amazing and weird and strange thing. Um, you might think that uh, there could be a mental state predicate which is, um, which is factive in uh, the philosopher's sense, uh, that is, it entails the truth of its complement, but not factive in the, um, in the linguist's sense. So for example, a mental state predicate which had uh, the meaning um, correctly believes that or has a true belief that. Um, and oddly, although there's a massive number of mental state predicates, none of them have that profile. So Anand and Hakkard have done a survey of uh, 1,100 English expressions uh, that take declarative complements, and they haven't found any that fall into that gap um, between what linguists mean by factive and what philosophers mean by factive that are mental states. Uh, and that seems sort of strange to me and sort of interesting to me when I first read it. Like, why don't we somehow lexicalize something with the force of has a true belief that? Um, why exactly are factive mental states more than just veridical? So it's not just that being in the state means that I'm locked onto the truth. It's also that um, instinctively, when you make attributions of this state, even if you're denying that the state is present or you're questioning whether it's present or you're reasoning hypothetically, putting it in the antecedent of the conditional, wondering about whether, uh, what would be the consequence if, uh, if this state were to obtain, if you're doing any of those things, um, you're working against uh, just the background of true propositions. Um, you're presupposing the complement of that kind of mental state to be true, even when you're questioning, even when you're denying. Um, OK, so I have a theory about this. Uh, if you flip over to page two, 
uh, of the handout. And I'm going to just grab my water bottle. So, um, uh, so the idea is that um, there's something very simple about fact of mental states in that when we try to perform mental state attributions, we have, as sophisticated neurotypical adults, two possible domains um, that we could use for understanding other agents. We could either ask, how are these other agents around me related to this reality that we both inhabit, right? So what do they see to be the case? What do they know to be the case? What are they aware of inside this reality? And what are they not aware of? So we could take that domain just of things that are true and ask for each agent the kind of binary question. Um, does he know it or not? Can he see it or not? Is this occluded from his view or is it, is it open and within his sight? We can do that kind of assessment. We can also do a much more complex assessment where we ask of each agent and of any proposition within the wild, wild world of all conceivable propositions, um, what the relationship is between that agent and that proposition. So if we do that kind of larger task and we look at this huge domain of all conceivable propositions, that's the instinctive domain of believing that something's the case or thinking that something's the case. Um, we are, uh, we're doing something that's actually quite a bit more subtle. Um, if I look at you and just ask, what do you and don't you know about um, the objects and events in this room? I have a fairly limited problem space to work with, right? Because the objects and events in this room, well, that's not, not an unbounded, uh, that's not an unbounded list. If I ask instead, what do you and don't you believe about the objects in this room? There's a much wider range of things that I might have to take into account. There could be all kinds of weird idiosyncratic misconceptions that you would have uh, about what's going on in this room. So it's sort of like um, in the task of attributing men fact of mental states, uh, I imagine each of you as having some kind of, this is a <coughs> metaphor, but maybe it'll help, some kind of uh, photograph of the contents of this room where I'm assuming the fidelity of photography. And if I ask, what does everybody here believe about the contents of this room? I'm imagining each of you as constructing his or her own individual, subjective, private painting of the contents of this room, um, where the painting might reflect uh, hallucinations and delusions, as well as uh, revealing what's in the room. When I say that I imagine each of you as having a photograph of the room, I'm not assuming that you all have the same picture. From each vantage point in the room, there will be some things that are open to your view uh, and not to mine, or to mine and not to yours. I automatically calculate other people's visual perspective as I interact with them, um, you know, which is why I'm sort of like embarrassed when I make a fool of myself in front of other people, is that I can instinctively and automatically um, attribute to them um, perceptual awareness of what it is that I am doing. Um, so, uh, so the idea is that there's something kind of simpler about those fact of mental states. Now, it's also true, um, something I should emphasize, it's also true that once you're working with that much larger realm of all the different pictures that we might be painting of this room, many of which could be arbitrarily at variance with what's actually going on here, um, we can then go in and do um, attributions of knowledge against that larger background of all conceivable propositions. We can do this. It's not something that we ordinarily, instinctively do uh, in the course of everyday, unreflective conversation or mental state attribution, but it's something that's certainly within our capacity, and it's something that we do a lot as epistemologists. So as epistemologists, we can take a proposition which is false, even conspicuously false, like the proposition you know, that there is uh, that there is a goat in this room right here. Um, and we can say, 
Nobody in this room knows that that is the case, that there is a goat in this room right here, right? Um, that is literally true. Like it's not, uh, it's not a false or in any way a stretching of the meaning of to know, um, to say that we don't know uh, that P, whenever P is a false proposition. It's just not something that we ordinarily instinctively do. Um, the way we might ordinarily and instinctively um, uh, judge when something is occluded from the visual perspective of others. So I'm a, a judge that, 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 that this thing, this event, this object is, uh, is unseen or unknown, right? So from where I'm standing right now, um, it's instinctive to, to me that none of you knows how many fingers I'm holding up behind the chair, right? That's something that's automatic. Uh, and it's something that is within my immediate sense of reality um, that I'm denying knowledge of. Uh, and that's something that's much more uh, instinctive and automatic than the denial of knowledge of a conspicuously false proposition like the proposition about the goat in the room. OK, so now we're going to start. So now we've got like, some idea of the fact of non-fact of mental state con uh, contrast and um, some suggestion about why fact of mental states are, um, fact of mental states presuppose as opposed to just entailing their complements. Because um, these fact of mental states get attributed to agents who are interacting with our shared reality and for the purpose of, um, of governing our expectations about how these other agents will, uh, will um, behave with respect to, to that reality. Uh, uh, what, uh, OK, but um, maybe this is going to get more concrete if I look at how this plays out in actual mental state attribution by creatures like us. So um, if you look at number seven on your handout, um, I have a quotation from a very interesting uh, paper by Alia Martin and Laurie Santos from 2016. Uh, and they're very interested in the question of whether uh, apes have the concept of ignorance as well as the concept of knowledge. Um, they were in that paper toying with the idea that possibly apes could understand knowledge, but they couldn't understand ignorance. Um, and they have various little uh, points of data uh, that might be suggestive of something like that. Um, they observed that apes seem to be capable of uh, positively generating states of knowledge deliberately uh, in, their, in, uh, in other agents. Um, but they were skeptical that apes could strategically generate states of ignorance. So that was one part of it. Um, but they had this idea that, I'm quoting now, the act of representing a relation between an agent and a piece of information that is not part of our current reality is a computational challenge. Uh, and I think that that's right. So if we have a piece of information that's not part of our current reality, um, like, uh, 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 um, like suppose we have moved an object from one container to another container, um, and the proposition that the object is still in container A, it's not part of our current reality anymore because we know the object has moved. But if we want to see another agent who witnessed the initial placement of the object but didn't witness the transfer as believing that the object is still in location A, as having a false belief, um, we're, going to have to, uh, we're going to have to do this task of keeping track of their misconception, even as we are at the same time keeping track of the way reality really is now. Um, so this kind of representation, representing state between this agent, piece of information that's not part of our current reality, um, demands that, I'm quoting, uh, mind readers have, quote, the capacity to conceive of states of the world that are different or decoupled from their own current reality. And Martin and Santos point out, look, false, false belief attribution is requiring this. Um, but then they suggest that the representation of ignorance also requires this. So recognizing that an agent is in a state of ignorance requires an organism to form a relation between an agent and a state of, a of the world that is, in a, an important sense, decoupled from the organism's own reality. 
Um, and this strikes me as a mistake, right? It's true that uh, neurotypical adults can reflectively, explicitly, and deliberately represent states of ignorance towards propositions that are decoupled uh, from our current reality, right? So I could say, for example, uh, Billy doesn't know that the tooth fairy visited last night because there isn't really any such creature. Um, I can do that um, deliberately and reflectively. Instinctive attributions of ignorance, unlike those deliberate reflective attributions of ignorance, instinctive attributions of ignorance actually really do map, well, in fact, the absence of a relationship between an agent and something that is part of my reality. So I can instinctively see you as ignorant of something that is occluded from your view. Um, this thing that I know is occluded from your view is part of my current reality. Actually, by an interesting kind of symmetry, I can see you as knowing things that I don't know. I can see you as knowing what's going on on the, on the other side of an opaque, uh, of an opaque barrier. Um, instinctive attributions of ignorance are about parts of reality that the ignorant agent is missing. Um, they don't naturally invoke a decoupled representation of something that's hypothetical or false. OK, so um, in fact, notwithstanding the Martin and Santos paper, um, I think that non-human animals, including ravens, chimpanzees, and rhesus monkeys, um, actually can attribute both knowledge and ignorance. And in fact, I think there's something ultimately a little bit incoherent with the suggestion that uh, primates could have, non-human primates could have the concept of knowledge but lack the concept of ignorance. If you think of ignorance as just being the lack of or the absence of knowledge, right? It's part of having the concept of knowledge that you can draw a line between states which are states of knowledge and states which are falling short of it, states which are not. Um, so so, I, so I, think, I think there's something ultimately untenable about that kind of paper, about that kind of um, position. In any event, um, we have the idea that, uh, um, that animals of various kinds can distinguish between ignorant and knowledgeable competitors uh, in, uh, in situations where there's a uh, monopolizable food resource, uh, and the uh, competing animal is maybe a dominant or uh, uh, something, uh, another uh, bird that could steal the, f the food that they've cached. They'll behave differently, whether they're being seen or they're not being seen. Um, and I've given you some citations to uh, some really interesting empirical work on that. I especially recommend um, the paper by Thomas Bunyar and colleagues on what ravens know about when other ravens are or are not watching them. Because I think it's a real um, masterpiece of showing that there is genuine belief attribution going on there. And it's not just that ravens behave differently when the faces or beaks of other ravens are pointed towards them. It's actually more that they can make an inference from their own subjective experience of the world to some conclusions about how other birds uh, are perceiving them. So I think this is really sort of powerful and interesting work. It's sometimes raised as an objection to the idea that knowledge ignorance discrimination is easier than um, belief attribution, uh, that on the standard scale of uh, mental state attribution, there is a task called the diverse beliefs task, um, which is actually passed before the task requiring you to distinguish between states of knowledge and states of ignorance in another, uh, in another agent. Uh, for the record, I'm actually really skeptical of the diverse beliefs task. It's not a task where the child has to make sense of the behavior of two agents who have different beliefs. Uh, it's not a task where the uh, child even has to figure out what the beliefs of other agents are. It's just a task in which the child is told that another agent has a belief uh, which differs from something that the child has just said. And to pass the task, the child just has to repeat back, basically repeat back what they've been told. Um, so I'm actually fairly skeptical that this, uh, that this task shows belief understanding. I'm, I'm, I'm not alone in thinking that. Um, OK, and there have been suggestions that maybe apes can do some kind of anticipatory looking, which signals possibly some kind of implicit 
recognition of, uh, of false beliefs. So this is a paper from 2016 by uh, Chris Kupenia and colleagues coming out of Tomasello's lab. Tomasello has now, um, has now rejected the tentative conclusion that he drew in that paper. Um, and he's now arguing that apes cannot attribute belief. They don't have any grasp, even an implicit grasp, of the nature of belief, uh, where they do, in fact, distinguish between knowing and failing to know. Um, they can't tell what believing is. And it's partly because they can't deal with this much larger and much more uncontrollable subjective domain in which each agent is painting a picture of reality which might diverge arbitrarily from how reality actually, uh, actually is. Um, so, uh, so, but there's, there's, there's something that happens in Tomasello's most recent paper where he argues that uh, apes don't have the concept of belief, but we do. Um, there's something very strange that happens that I want to, uh, that I want to walk through now, okay? So, um, uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, being able to distinguish between these black and white states of knowing and failing to know uh, is not always an adequate basis for predicting what people will do. Because sometimes, as a matter of fact, people do act not on the basis of what they know, but on the basis of some misconception, even a very predictable misconception um, that they might have. For example, if I have lied to you, and, I'm, uh, and I have every reason to believe that you've fallen for my, for my lie, maybe you've even given me some kind of epistemic back channel feedback signal, you said, oh, OK. Uh, I tell you that the, that the meeting is at two, uh, you seem to take that on board. Now, even though I personally know that the meeting is at 1.30, and I'm trying to get you to arrive late so that you'll look bad, um, I can see you as having the false belief that the meeting is at two, um, because you've signaled to me that you've taken on board uh, what I've said. And I'll anticipate that you'll arrive later rather than earlier. Um, or actually, even you don't have to get into that kind of uh, complex situation. You can have much simpler situations in which you could anticipate um, that someone else is going to have a misconception about, for example, where something is. So Tomasello points out, look, uh, you know, it's not like we're the only creatures who see uh, members of our kind acting on the basis of incomplete information or falling for. Um, falling for deception fall, or stumbling into some kind of misconception. Uh, other animals must certainly see things being moved behind, behind the back of, of their competitors. Uh, so there are going to be situations in which you could have a competitive advantage. If you could anticipate what kind of misconception um, your competitors would have, if you, could, uh, if you could see them as having a false belief. Um, the interesting question is, why don't um, other animals who also have experience of um, their friends and fellows uh, having false beliefs, why don't they get that more subtle predictive capacity to attribute false beliefs? Um, OK, uh, so, um, so there is some kind of competitive advantage to it. Uh, and we as human beings, when we get the computational capacity to deal with this much larger domain of all kinds of conceivable propositions. And here it seems like our um, capacity to, uh, to use natural language uh, must surely play a very large role in enabling us to represent uh, non-actual states of affairs, right? Uh, that, 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 that must be a very, very large part of it. The puzzle that emerges almost immediately uh, isn't, OK, why can't apes do this? Because you could think, yeah, it's too much of a computational challenge for them to manage this larger domain. The puzzle that emerges almost immediately, which Tom Sullivan doesn't confront directly, is why do we continue thinking uh, in terms of knowledge after we've got the more subtle and the more con cautious concept of belief on board? Um, so, uh, so Tom Sell is very clear. If you look at number 12 on the handout, he sees the capacity of grasping what other agents see and what they know as a prerequisite 
Uh, it's a necessary stage you have to go through. It's a basis for subsequent ability to grasp beliefs. So I only can tell that you're going to have the false belief or misconception that the object is still over here because I initially attributed to you a state of seeing that it was being placed here, right? I didn't initially look at you and think, well, it's a completely open question what you might believe about this world, right? I start out by seeing you as having some states of knowledge, uh, and then I refine that when things, for example, shift behind your back. Uh, I represent you as now being in a state of, uh, of belief rather than knowing. Um, so, so here's the question. Um, if perceiving what, if, if being able to track what agents um, perceive and know is a prerequisite for this more subtle ability to attribute, uh, to attribute um, belief as opposed to just knowledge and ignorance. Why, when we've passed the more advanced course, do we keep on taking that prerequisite? Why do we keep on doing that? Um, you might think, as soon as we have the concept of belief, uh, we would just switch over to understanding all agentive behavior in terms of belief-desire models. To know that something is the case entails believing that it's the case. If I know my water bottle's on the table here, I also believe that it's on the table here, right? So um, you might think the belief, which is a, uh, you know, it's a, a more subtle, more cautious state to attribute, uh, explains and predicts my action just as well as a state of knowledge would, right? What I, as an agent, uh, am going to do is going to be exactly the same whether I believe that this is water or whether I know that this is water. Either of those states is equally going to generate in me um, the ability to drink. OK, so, um, so you could just take a view like the view that Stephen Stitch has, that what knowledge adds to belief is not psychologically relevant, right? Um, OK, so, um, so curiously, Thomas Sello seems to really double down on the idea of, uh, of belief attribution. Uh, and if you have a look at quote 13, um, you have a sense of the problem he's going to start getting himself into. Um, OK, so Thomas Sello says, contemporary researchers in theory of mind are committed to the following consensus. To predict and explain an agent's behavior in novel circumstances, one must understand that beh agents behave not with respect to reality, but with respect to their beliefs about reality. He's searching for his toy over there, even though it's actually here, because he believes it's over there. Understanding how beliefs work thus implies an understanding of the fundamental distinction, traceable back to the ancient Greeks, between a subjective perspective, that is, appearance, opinion, belief, and an objective perspective, reality, fact, truth. OK, there's several things in here which are kind of weird and kind of interesting. The basic idea is this. When you're a grown-up, uh, and you're not an ape and you're not a kid, when you're actually a grown-up, you recognize people have beliefs. People are governed by their beliefs. People aren't governed by reality. They're governed by these paintings that they're, that they're, they're, they're constructing uh, of reality, uh, where we all understand, we're grown-ups here, that these paintings can, can diverge from how reality actually is. right? Um, uh, so. So then you've got to get the idea that there's a difference between appearance, opinion, and belief. That's what really governs your behavior. And then there's this idea of an objective perspective, reality, fact, truth. Now, there seems to be a little bit, there's something a little bit not quite analogous between the subjective perspective, appearance, opinion, and belief, and the objective perspective. Um, notice that he's putting under objective perspective reality, fact, and truth. And you might think, wait a second, reality is not a perspective, right? Like, reality was there, you know, 13 billion years ago after the Big Bang. There were no perspectives there. There were no agents sort of witnessing it from one side or another. Um, you might feel that maybe Tom Sellers should be thinking, if he's going to talk about objective perspectives, you might want him to have something more like the idea of knowing that something's the case, being aware that something is the case. Um, but he's created this suggestion that um, you've got to understand that agents are behaving with respect to what they believe. That's all they're ever doing. Uh, and that's really how we see each other. We see each other as behaving 
um, on the basis of belief, not necessarily on the basis of knowledge. OK, so if you look at uh, quote 14, when Tom Sell is talking about the pull of the real for three-year-olds who give the wrong answer on explicit false belief tasks, that is, after the object has been moved in the absence of the agent, they will say, oh, no, the, agent, uh, the agent's going to reach for it here, because, because that's where it is. They can't maintain um, that difficult, decoupled representation of the object as being over here, which was where that agent saw it last. Um, here's what Thomas Sella says. Three-year-olds can understand something about an objective perspective on the situation, but they coordinate that objective perspective poorly with the subjective perspectives involved. Indeed, an adult-like understanding would actually involve three coordinated perspectives. The agent's perspective, the child's own perspective, and the objective perspective on how things really are. In the classic task, the child's own perspective and the objective task and the objective perspective are in a sense confounded. The child saw the toy being moved to a new location where she now assumes it really is. However, a fully adult-like understanding would include the proviso that the child herself might potentially be wrong. Perhaps the cabinet has a false bottom or someone has tricked her. Um, so, you know, here I am just kind of stipulating, waving my hands in the air, that the object has moved from here to there. I could actually perform this in real life with a cup or something like that. Uh, and it's only going to work as a good test if it's like an opaque cup so you can't uh, instantly see inside. But, um, but the idea is that uh, what you're actually seeing there from your perspective uh, should, if you're taking a fully adult-like uh, angle on this um, should be interpreted, in fact, more cautiously. That you think to yourself, not only, who that agent over there, she's going to be wrong about where that object is, because uh, she last saw it here and uh, it's been moved in her absence. But you're also even going to be saying about yourself, you know what? I could be wrong too. I could always be wrong. We could always, uh, we could always be out of line with reality. Here we are, all painting our pictures, myself included. Uh, and uh, and we could all be uh, we could all be getting this wrong. Um, so to fully understand the notion of belief, Thomas Ello continues, and I'm quoting: One must understand that whether the evidence is weak or strong, the believer, the agent, the person observing the agent, or both, can always be wrong from an objective perspective. That is what defines the notion of belief. So there's something that I like about this, and there's something I'm very uncomfortable with, right? So I like the idea that it's built into the, uh, to the concept of belief, that there's a possible slippage between, uh, between reality and the world, right? That's, that is definitive of the concept of belief, this idea that belief as such is a state which could link you to either truths or falsehoods. But I want to say, as an epistemologist, there is a special class of beliefs uh, which have the interesting characteristic that they, that they can link you only to the truth, uh, right? So I'm not, it, like, it looks here a little bit like Tom Stella is moving towards ruling out um, the, idea of, uh, the idea of knowledge. Or maybe it's just that he's ruling out the idea of knowledge attribution. That if you get serious, not only about the other person's perspective, but if you take a fully adult-like view of your own perspective as well, um, you will always have to think, you know what, but I could be wrong too. Um, OK, so, um, so uh, if, you, if you go back to the handout, he has this you know, uh, description of what's going on in triangulation, where we're both attending to a situation simultaneously, and in some weird sense, imagining it from above as well. Um, quote 16 on the handout gives you sort of the most detailed description of this. And it invokes a notion of a bird's eye view, which I find very interesting, because uh, it's kind of sneaking the concept of knowledge back in, while at the same time denying the idea that any actual subject can ever occupy that position. Um, so, so he, uh, 16 on your handout, um, quoting again from this 2018 PNAS paper by Tom Sello. 
Quote, in joint attentional interactions, partners are constantly attempting to align their goals and attention. This aligning of attention may happen as one individual simply follows the attention of the other. And they then somehow acknowledge, for example, by a mutual look, um, that they are now engaged in joint attention. Often, however, one individual actively attempts to align another's attention with his own via referential communication. Look at this bottle here. Um, in the prototypical situation with infant and adult, one of the partners initiates things by offering the other an object, showing the other an object, pointing to some interesting event, or even using a simple piece of language. The communicator has the goal of having the recipient attend to what the communicator is already attending to. The communicator's referential goal is the aligning of their attention in joint attention. If the recipient exceeds, she moves her own individual attention from something else to jointly attending with the partner. Um, the interpersonal negotiation thus involves each partner sequentially shifting from individual to joint attention as either communicator or recipient. Unlike simply imagining what another person is seeing or attending to, with no attention to one's own seeing or attending, negotiating joint attention brings into focus the relation between the two perspectives. They are initially not now aligned. Uh, it should be they are now aligned um, after joint initiation, uh, joint attention has been initiated, and to know that they are now aligned after communication. There must be at least some imagining of the content of both perspectives and their relationship. So I've got to not only be locked in on the water bottle and seeing you as locked in on the water bottle, but I've got to simultaneously kind of imagine an angle from which I see us both as attending to, uh, to that same thing. Um, so this requires an executive level of cognitive functioning a bird's eye view in which these two perspectives may be compared in the same representational format to see if there is alignment. Uh, OK, so a bird's eye view. Now, this is kind of a metaphor. I, in fact, actually prefer the older metaphor for that epistemic position, which is the god's eye view, right? Which, I mean, like, what do birds know? Anyway, birds are painting their own, like, weird, subjective, birdie pictures of what's going on. And they might miss things about, you know, the interaction between us two as agents, and are we, or are we not locked onto this thing? Um, but you'll notice that even while he's saying, oh, come on, guys, now that we're adults, um, we are always aware that we can always be mistaken about things. Um, maybe all we really have governing our actions uh, is belief, right? Um, Tom Sewell is nonetheless helping himself when he talks about knowing that there's mutual alignment between me and you on this object. He's helping himself to that much stronger kind of locution where if we were in a position of knowing something, then, uh, uh, then there wouldn't be that possibility that, ooh, maybe, uh, maybe you and I aren't actually uh, coordinated on the same object in the way that we thought we were. So he's, he's invoking this idea of something like a God's eye, uh, God's eye view, even while he's suggesting that for us to occupy the fully adult perspective, we've got to give that up. Um, so it looks like this knowledge of alignment that we <coughs> might aim to share uh, is something like common knowledge. And this brings us to um, the last bit of my talk, if you flip over the page. Um, to, uh, to the discussion of common knowledge. Uh, so, um, so the idea of common knowledge, very shortly, is something like this. Um, I feel like I'm going to have to ask Patrick to look at the water bottle for a moment. Now, Patrick and I have common knowledge that we're both looking at this water bottle. If not only I look at it, and I know that I'm looking at it, and he knows, and he's looking at it, and I know that he's looking at it, right? But um, let's just take the proposition that the water bottle is on the table. We have common knowledge of that proposition, that the water bottle is on the table. Um, if I know that it's on the table, and I know that Patrick knows that it's on the table, and I know that he knows that I know that it's on the table, and so on, ad infinitum, right? Um, that's the idea of, uh, of common knowledge. And I give you Letterman's formulation, Harvey Letterman's formulation of it on the, uh, on the, uh, on the handout there. 
Um, and there are a number of sort of coordination problems for which it's been suggested that common knowledge is the necessary, uh, is the necessary solution. I'll talk about one of them uh, this afternoon. But I just wanted to get that idea of common knowledge onto the table. Um, and one of the things that's kind of puzzling and weird about the idea of common knowledge is this ad infinitum clause that we've thrown in there, right? Like, I know, and I know that he knows, and I know that he knows that I know, and so on, and going back and forth, that kind of zigzag back and forth between us. Um, uh, Letterman agrees that we have some kind of pre-theoretical notion of certain things being public information, being out in the open between us. Uh, his paper, Uncommon Knowledge, actually starts with a really vivid example in which uh, two friends are walking down the street and they see a public carnival. Uh, and one of them points it out to the other and they stop and watch it for a while. And as they're watching it, one of the two friends is remembering privately a childhood experience he had of wonder upon encountering a carnival of just that sort. And as the two friends walk away, uh, one, the, the one who remembered this childhood episode starts explaining to his friend uh, that he was just remembering this and talking to him about his, about his childhood experience. And Letterman says, OK, there's something very compelling here that initially the fact that there was a street carnival out there um, when joint attention had been established was something that was um, public information. It was obvious. It was there. It was out in the open view. Um, uh, that, uh, that this was taking place. And initially, the childhood recollection of one of the two friends was not like that. It was something private. It was something restricted to within the one agent. When they started walking away, uh, and the friend tells his other friend the story of what happened to him as a child, that information is now also brought out into the public. Um, between them, and they both have access to it. It's not private in the way that it was before, um, before the telling. There is some kind of uh, very compelling um, pre-theoretical notion here that we have between public and private. And a lot of people have tried to theorize this in terms of, uh, in terms of common knowledge, that for us to have public information is for us to mutually know to any degree that, uh, that not only I'm aware of this, but you're aware of it, and I'm aware that you're aware, and so on. Um, Letterman has a very interesting um, example, which he takes to illustrate the impossibility of, um, of common knowledge under some conditions which initially seem incredibly plausible. Um, so I'll, I'll briefly go through this example. Um, so he imagines two characters. Uh, he calls them Roman and Columba, who are on a game show where they can win a cash prize of $1,000 for accurately making a very simple judgment. All they have to do is press a button if the object that is displayed on a little stage right in front of them is bigger than one meter tall. Um, and they'll win $1,000 if they press the button and the object is, in fact, uh, bigger than one meter tall. But there's two catches. One is they both have to press the button for them to win the prize. If just one of them thinks that the object is over a meter and the other doesn't, doesn't press their button for any reason, then they don't get the prize. In fact, they, whoever pressed the button has to pay a penalty of $100. Also, um, it has to actually be true that the object is over one meter tall, right? So if the object is 99 centimeters tall and they both press their buttons, they both lose uh, uh, $100. Or if either of them presses their button in solitude, then they lose the money. Um, now, this is a classic problem where it looks like some kind of common knowledge is at work because um, it's, it's easiest if you start out thinking of this with things that are over a meter, but not a whole lot over a meter. Um, I have to look at the object and think, not only like, yeah, I, I, that's over a meter, but I have to think, uh, Roman over there, it's enough, obviously, over a meter tall that surely Roman's going to press his button as well, right? I have to know that he knows um, that, uh, that the object is, uh, is tall enough. But actually, if I think about it a little harder, 
I've got to expect that however this object looks to him, uh, he's going to see me as being ready to press my button on it, right? So he's got to also see me as thinking that it's over a certain height. You can actually start going through more and more of those, uh, more and more of those iterations. Um, you can see that, that Roman and Columba might be very hesitant to press their buttons if the object is just a bit over. Because even if I'm pretty confident, there's a question about how confident I should be in your confidence or in your confidence about my confidence and so on, right? Um, in fact, Harvey Letterman argues, if you um, even have a very large object, like something that is three meters tall, so it's obviously really conspicuously um, uh, over one meter tall, seems like that should be very, very easy uh, for the two parties to have common knowledge ad infinitum that the object is over a meter tall. The problem with this, Letterman argues, is that in each iteration of common knowledge, as you zigzag back and forth between one character and the other, um, there's a tiny bit of slippage um, because at each stage, you are uh, allowing that the way things appear to your partner in this game show could be just a little bit out of line with the way that they appear to you. Um, and if you, you, can, you can read through the, uh, read through the reasoning in his example. Um, what he concludes is you can't have common knowledge ad infinitum of even propositions that seem very, very obviously, uh, very, very obviously public. As soon as there's even just a little bit of slippage um, between appearance and reality, even if the slippage is so small that it poses no threat to ordinary first order private knowledge of the fact. Uh, common knowledge of the fact is going, to be, uh, is going to be impossible. I'll just end today by reading the quotation, uh, a quotation from uh, near the end of Letterman's paper about the problem of common knowledge, um, which I find very, uh, very interesting and, uh, and compelling. OK, so I'm quoting, quoting Letterman. Our beliefs more or less accurately reflect the world around us. The proponents of common knowledge and its relatives, this is also a problem he generalizes to common belief, so believing that someone else believes that you believe in so. Um, suppose that when two people meet, their beliefs create a hall of mirrors. Each person's beliefs reflect the world, but also the other's beliefs, which in turn reflect the first person's beliefs, and so on, in an infinite sequence of reflections of reflections. They imagine that certain objects and events are so positioned in this hall of mirrors that these objects and events are recognizably represented in each of the reflections in this infinite sequence. They propose that people will coordinate successfully only if they manage to position their actions in this exact way in the marvelous hall of mirrors created by their minds. But our minds often reflect the world imperfectly. I have argued that the presence of slight aberrations on the surface of each mirror has the consequence that as we move further and further along this sequence of reflections, the original image becomes blurred and ultimately unrecognizable. Um, so that's the, that's, the problem, that's the problem of common knowledge. Um, this afternoon, we're going to look at uh, what might be a new approach to it, a new way of trying to answer these difficulties. Thank you. But we are saying that in the case, it's uh, pretty much clear that the cell, the, the cell box is much taller than right. the yes. one meter. So Absolutely. Even if there is some amount of variation, I can say that I mean that variation doesn't really bear on the I mean the common knowledge that 
the same boat. So it's actually a lot taller than right. the, the, the one meter. So it just uh, doesn't have like uh, like doesn't really have a strong bearing to to absolutely absolutely to, to, become, so, a, to become a knowledge. To so there's a yeah. The problem is we're working with a very technical understanding of what common knowledge is. Where common knowledge is mutual knowledge ad infinitum. Yeah. There's no problem with mutual knowledge to degree, you know, 28, uh, that the object is over one meter tall. The problem is really generated from wanting to go all the way to ad infinitum, um, yeah. which is something that's really hard to even start to represent in your mind, even what that means. Yeah. What it would actually mean is that Columbo would have to say, Roman knows that I know that he knows that I know that he knows, and so on and so on, you know, down for yeah. many, many, many iterations. The thing is, what's happening is you're just losing a tiny bit <coughs> on each iteration. Yeah. Um, if, I, if I look at you as, um, so I know, uh, uh, I, I can know, he's not, he's not a skeptic about, he's, he's not a skeptic about what's, what's known, right? Um, I can know that it's, uh, uh, I can know that it's over a meter tall. Um, and in fact, maybe I can even know that it will appear to you to be within a certain range of three meters, right? I can't know that it will appear to you to be precisely 3.0000 endless zeros, three meters. Uh, and that's because I have, unfortunately, certain background knowledge of the limits of the acuity of our perceptual systems that we don't have that kind of hyper-precise matching um, between appearance and reality as far as our perceptual systems are concerned. So I might worry that it could appear to you to be 2.999999 meters yeah. tall. I should worry about that. And then once I'm worrying about that, once I'm painting my picture of you as perhaps set at 2.999999, that's how it appears to you, I should then ask myself, what kind of picture are you painting of my epistemic position? If your picture is really that this thing looks 2.999999, when you paint a picture of me, you've got to worry yeah. that I'm at 2.999, a, yeah. a little lower, right? So each time um, you flip back and forth between uh, my mind, my representation of your mind, your representation of my representation of your mind, each time you zig or zag backwards between, and forwards between the two of us, um, you lose a little bit right. of height that you can take for granted. That's the way the yeah, argument yeah, is yeah. going. Now, Lederman doesn't doubt that smart contestants on this game show are absolutely going to press their buttons and that it's public information that the thing is over three meters tall. That's out in the open, it's out in the street the way the street carnival is. Um, what he's thinking is that Whatever explains the rationality of that act, it's not the technical notion of common knowledge. Um, and so, so maybe one of the questions we can have here is, is this suggesting that you can't do this thing that Tom Sello thinks that you can do, where you take a bird's eye, I prefer God's eye perspective on the two characters, and you say, ah, yes, we're both in exactly the same alignment on this object. Yeah. Uh, so quick follow-up on this. Yeah. Uh, this uh, yeah. I think probably I don't know, maybe one could try to say like okay so probably there's this tiny variation in our like attribution yes our measuring of the yeah. uh, height of the tallness of the yeah. stuff uh, maybe we could define that in terms of <laughs> like a converging infinite converging like sequences of values so, yeah. so like you say, okay, even if there's a uh, sort of constant like variation sort of um, between between the values we can attribute to to Thomas, we can say that this is a, uh, if you take the limit of the <laughs> of the values, then there's a sort of converging point. So uh, so maybe what we so maybe we can try to to define. Uh, like the uh, difference in attributions to disappear or something like uh, the. Uh, we would love that to be the case. Unfortunately, the sequence is not converging. Okay. It actually is a lot like two mirrors reflecting each other. Mm -hmm. That it, you know, if you're in one of those elevators where it's like mirrored on both sides, as you look into the ad infinitum, it gets darker and darker back there, right? 
Uh, and that is because you're losing a little bit, you're, you're losing some photons with every, uh, with, with, every, with every bounce. So I think you're absolutely right that the problem can be solved. The idea is just it can't be solved with that um, sort yeah, of technical was, yeah, yeah, idea. Was, uh, maybe it's for suggestion. Yeah, there's something. I was thinking of probably a, a mathematical way of. of yeah, sort of yeah, if only, right? Finding sort that would be fantastic. Of, uh, that would be fantastic. Way, way there may be a mathematical way to do it, but it's not the classical common knowledge way. Yeah, or, yeah, so, yeah, it's, yeah. so it seems. So it seems. Uh, Right. Well, so, uh, well, I think it's for so, I mean, one way to do it would be so, okay. So, for all uh, Roman nodes, so, to, so Roman takes it to be more likely that uh, Columba has the same appearance, but it's also possible that, although less likely, that uh, that she has a slightly different appearance. And then, once you start the mirroring, the likelihood would decrease and eventually reach zero. I mean, that would be one way to do it. I mean, it wouldn't reach zero, but it would be, go down. Like, it reduces, like, keeps, yeah. keeps reducing yeah. until it vanishes. The difference between, like, the attribution, the different, the two characters' attributions, uh, the two characters, uh, okay, uh, uh, majors, the... Yeah, again, depending on how you are describing this, it might not be, that might not be equivalent to the old idea of common knowledge. So when you talk about the same, right, is that going to, um, there's a question about how, how that's going to be understood by the two individual, uh, by the two individual parties. Like, uh, it's not clear that they have a common reference for the understanding of what it is to see it as being the same. So that's sort of a, like, the, the, very, the very idea that they can, they can represent that is, is something that's uh, e sort of equally, equally problematic within this framework. I mean, yeah. since it's iterated, so if we take it to be even slightly more likely that we have the same appearance, like, uh, let's say one meter, uh, and I think okay, so it's, it's also possible, although slightly less likely, that you have a slightly different appearance, right? And then, and if I assume that you think exactly the same way, then the likelihood of, uh, you know, us diverging like that would also go down. Yeah. So that, that, that's the idea of that. Yeah. Thinking. Yeah, that's that's an intriguing idea. I'm I'm not sure that that works though. Yeah. I'm not sure that that works, especially because you have to you have to think about how the other person is thinking about how you're thinking. Like if you want to fit this yeah, back yeah. into the classic idea of common knowledge, I think you might be suggesting a sort of different way of understanding the idea of public yeah. information, which is actually probably what we want anyway, um, unless there's some sort of weird, bizarre way that you could, um, you could construct that uh, possibility of uh, reflection ad infinitum. Maybe there's a sort of funny artificial way we can do that. Um, okay. Okay. So this is not something that I think, but I, I can imagine some epistemologist friends yes. having a question like this. So this is um, on a left. Puzzle yes, knowledge. right. So we become capable of belief attribution. Why do we keep engaging on knowledge attribution? And I think there's like really good and interesting like empirical, psychological, and evolutionary facts yes. that say like here's why we keep going with knowledge. But then there's a question I think some people are eyes like should we? Keep going yes, with knowledge? Like, absolutely. If knowledge is this thing that like we have a more sophisticated yes. framework of belief and truth and justification, throw them all together, whatever you think. Why should we should be using that if it's more sophisticated? So why should we keep using all? Yeah, I don't think that, but I, I yeah, can imagine absolutely. a lot of people having this thought. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So I think Hannah's like a um, David Christensen, people like that think, um, yeah, knowledge was knowledge was great uh, back in the day, and maybe it still serves some kind of loose talk practical purposes. It's real quick for me to say, oh yeah, he knows the meetings that too. I told him. Uh, it's really tedious for me to say, oh, yes, actually, he has a 99.978 cream, you know, uh, like, that's ridiculous, right? It's, it's, um, it's very convenient for me, even though maybe what I'm saying is literally false. Uh, if we have the sort of absolute ideal of knowledge as being a mental state which locks you onto the truth, unfortunately, now that we're grown-ups, at least when we're being proper epistemologists and we're trying to say what is literally true in the realm of the epistemic, um, we shouldn't really talk about that. That's an approximation that we use for practical purposes. I'm going to try to argue that it's not uh, this afternoon. But I think that's actually a very good question. Like, here I am talking about our 
talking about sort of descriptive facts about our practices. Here we are. We think we're mutually aligned on the thing. Um, are we really? Do we really occupy these states? Um, uh, you could have all kinds of reasons for thinking that we don't, and that the the even if our attributive practice keeps on instinctively saddling us with the concept of knowing. I, it's also true that our attributive practice instinctively saddles us with the idea that the earth is still and the sun is setting and the stars are revolving around, uh, you know. Uh, and and when, we're, uh, when we're doing grown-up science, we don't take those things at face value. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, uh, so I'm... I, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, tr I'm gonna try to argue this afternoon that um, the idea that all we've got is belief of various levels of quality. Um, that idea is actually in a weird. To be committed to that idea is actually in a weird way to be committed to the mistake of overfitting your data. Um, that you are going for something that is really cautious. Um, we're actually going for something that's a little bolder, uh, is, um, is in a number of ways a better lock on the truth. But I have to, yeah, I have to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to gonna try to talk about that um, uh, more this afternoon. But I think, it's, I think that's an excellent question. Even if we are doing this in practice, maybe we shouldn't. Um, or maybe we're doing it in practice for reasons that are ultimately pragmatic rather than concerned with locking onto the truth. My, uh, that's something that, something that I, I find myself stuck with at the end of the day, and um, I don't know whether I can fully explain this away, is the idea that um, even, if, even if you thought as an epistemologist, oh, come on, the truth of it is we're all only just painting these pictures, which might be a little, a little bit out of reality. I want to say, yeah, how did you get the right to say the truth of it is like this? Um, for us. Uh, actually, we were talking about the Theotetus the other night at dinner, right? And there's the same, uh, the same kind of structure in um, sort of classic resistance to arguments for relativism, right? That the relativist will say, oh, each man sees how it is for themselves. And the anti-relativist relativist says, hey, wait a second, relativist, are you taking a God's eye perspective looking down on each man and saying how it is for each of those? each of those individuals. How did you get the right to do that exactly? And so of course if you if you talk to if you talk to Hannes Lankov, he's um, Hannes Lankov actually started a question to me, challenging me on something I was saying at a recent talk with, uh, with the words, do you know and I felt like I okay, I want to stop you right there. Because because what you're asking for from me is you're asking for knowledge, and you're not wrong. That is the goal of inquiry. We do care about what's true. We do want to pursue knowledge here, and uh, and we shouldn't be too quick to give up on it, even if we can construct these fantastic models, which make it seem like, yeah, all you're ever doing is painting pictures, which could be arbitrarily out of touch with reality. Maybe there's some sort of backstop reasons why we don't want to embrace that. Um, so with the common knowledge stuff. Yeah. Uh, sometimes, sometimes people draw a distinction between sort of common knowledge as, a, as like a state, um, and then they kind of distance themselves from the idea that the way you reach that state is by engaging in any kind of complex reason. Right, yes. Um, so when, like in Lewis's convention, when he's talking about common knowledge, then he lists a bunch of ways in which you can achieve it. Yeah. And they're not intended to get you to think about reason. So I was wondering about the extent to which the criticism of the possibility of reaching common knowledge is contingent upon us supposing that you do it by reasoning your way to that mm -hmm. state, or whether it's really quite independent. The problem is quite independent of that. It doesn't matter how you reach the state. The state is still something that's difficult to reach. OK. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's, an, that's an excellent question. I think Letterman's argument doesn't specifically depend on Roman and Columba in real time going through a sequential progression in the argument. They could sort of instantaneously grasp the whole mathematical structure um, without, without reasoning in that way. I think um, there may be, um, and this may play into the issue with Lewis as well, there, um, 
the expression common knowledge is used in different ways. Sometimes it's just used for our pre-theoretical understanding of whatever is actually out in public and obvious between us. And, uh, and that notion is not something I want to get rid of. It's not something Letterman wants to get rid of. He's, he, he's absolutely believing in that notion. He's just questioning whether it is um, something that is, uh, can be captured or analyzed or represented in terms of infinite degrees of mutual knowledge. Um, whether you think of that as something that would have to be, like, I mean, no one's thinking in practice you could go through infinite cycles of reasoning. I mean, um, but, but could you be in somehow a mental state which could be well described or well captured by that kind of infinite equation? Uh, and and so, uh, so Levin thinks, no, that's not, that's not good. So there's, I mean, one of the things is common knowledge, the expression common knowledge gets used in a couple of different ways. Right. Um, and if it's just being used for that pre-theoretical notion, then, then it's so, not problematic. So, the, so the, the problem, the objection that's being raised is that, is this kind of intuitive notion, yeah. is an, an attempt to cash it out yeah. um, specifically. And then the thought is, well, if you look at the, the cashing out yeah. carefully, you can see it's quite different, that kind of state is yeah. very different from the intuitive notion. Like it's that, impossible, so and let's right. hope yeah, the intuitive yeah, right, notion right. is possible. But then this kind of raises the question, well, how is that intuitive notion best understood? Like, what do you even mean? And it's not something that you can just capture by, uh, well, each of the parties knows that P, because there really is a difference between each of us privately happening to know something and each of us being able to count on the other person knowing that we know it. And at least if you go up to like level three or level four, about the levels at which you can still kind of keep track of it, given the limits of human working memory, um, there really are sort of strategic differences between uh, you know, a signal that one of us possesses and we worry that the other might not possess. Thank you. Thank you.